So good afternoon and welcome to Company Roots. Today we're interviewing Patrick Dugan, the Director of Marketing and Communications at Pacific Community Ventures, a growth equity impact investing firm. It is a privilege and we are truly honored to interview you today. My name is Raul Kavoru. I'm a rising junior at St. Paul School in New Hampshire and I'm the president of Company Roots. Um, my name is Mark Wallier. I'm a rising freshman for Seton Hall University looking to study finance and I'm an interviewer for Company Roots. So the first question that we always like to start all of our interviews with are, what are your roots and how have they helped you in shaping your ideas and becoming the person you are today? I, so I grew up in, I grew up in New Hampshire in a part of the state that was kind of hollowed out by globalization. And I grew up seeing a lot of middle-class jobs leave the state, leave the country, it really affected my views of how of how finance investment and economic policy work for or against uh, working working people in our country and it was it was something that guided a lot of my beliefs and understanding about the way that our economy worked when i began working at pacific Com community ventures we invest we invest in small businesses that are owned by women and people of color who collectively start more businesses than anyone else in America, but who are drastically underfunded by the Small Business Administration, by banks, by equity investors. And we, you know, we exist to help folks create small businesses, create jobs, and to build generational community wealth. Um, the, the way that I grew up really guided me to do this kind of work later in life. Right. So for our viewers who obviously might not know too much about your work, um, can you please uh, briefly explain some of the uh, work that you do and also some of the projects that you have completed? Yeah. So Pacific Community Ventures is a 21-year-old community development financial institution. Basically, that means that we're an impact investor that puts money into small businesses that are owned by women and people of color, um, as well as small businesses that are in historically underinvested areas. We also operate a national business advising platform that connects anyone who has any kind of business knowledge, so seasoned entrepreneurs, um, senior leaders from Fortune 500s or any, any companies really with business owners who need advice. You know, in addition to capital, one of the biggest hindrances that business owners have in growing their companies is, is the advice gap. And that's especially pre uh, prevalent for businesses that are owned by, by women and people of color, as well as folks from more um, underprivileged backgrounds. You know, folks who, when, when a startup, when, when you think of like a typical startup in Silicon Valley getting money from an equity investor, they're getting capital, but they're also getting access to experts and networks. And most small businesses need those same kinds of things to really grow and thrive and create jobs and become sustainable. And so we operate this platform to give free access to those kinds of networks and advice to business owners who otherwise you know, couldn't afford to pay a dozen um, highly priced uh, business coaches. We also do consulting work. So we work with other investors, uh, everything from public equity investors down to um, local community investors who are trying to figure out how to align their capital and, and investment in order to create a financial return as well as social and environmental good. Yeah, that, uh, that's really uh, something really interesting to me, um, just because I think that that's something that really gets glossed over in Silicon Valley. And I mean, I'm only 17 years old. What do I know about Silicon Valley? But just, you know, what, just from what I've heard, they don't really measure themselves in social impact. So, you know, many VCs in the social impact space make impact reports on an annual basis. And, you know, as a marketing head, I was just wondering how are, if you're involved in this process and, you know, if you are, what's it like and who do you collaborate with to come up with these reports? So I, 
I work with our entire entire organization when it comes to how we report on financial and social impact. Um, I, you know, I am not an auditor. We work with auditors every year. We also have a team that does um, social and financial impact reporting within our organization. And so we are internally and externally vetted. And in addition to that, we report on the results that the small businesses that we invest in or provide free advice to have in terms of how they increase um, revenue versus comparable small businesses, both in California and nationally. We report on job growth. And for us, we have a measurable definition of a good job that has six factors. And so we, you know, unlike some community investors for whom, um, you know, creating a job is the end goal, to us, it doesn't really matter if that job doesn't pay a good wage, if it doesn't have benefits. And so we have a, a measurable definition of a good job that we also measure against. So we report on the actual uh, quality of the jobs that are being created by our dollars each and every year. We... Uh, we put together a report every year that I'm, you know, I'm involved in the writing of it, the narrative, the design of it, and then how we present those results to our, to our funders and to prospective funders. Great. So kind of relating to like the social impact field, I also noticed you were um, the business advising org mentor at PCV. So mm -hmm. what specific work are you um, involved with in that role? So I oversee marketing and communications for the whole organization. And that means that I oversee the, the organizational level marketing strategy, as well as all of the tactics within our programs. So that could be anything from demand generation, um, getting out the word about our small business loan programs to business owners in California, as well as other, other bankers and brokers who may not be able to work with business owners so that they can be referred to us. I also work on the promotion of our business advising platform. And that means making business owners in all 50 states aware about the free platform, as well as trying to make uh, companies who are looking for platforms to manage employee volunteerism aware of the platform as well. You know, we have a um, we have a pretty turnkey solution for companies who want to offer their employees remote volunteer opportunities, which is perfect at a time that we're all living through where people can't meet face to face. Um, with our platform, anyone who has any kind of business experience can volunteer five hours a month from home and be matched with a business owner who might need help in marketing, sales, finance, operations, IT, you know, you, you name it, there's a business owner in America who, who could use some free advice. Okay. Um, so I oversee all of the marketing and promotion for that, as well as the, the branding and the content marketing for our impact investing research and consulting practice. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting because uh, you mentioned how a lot of companies right now are really struggling to get that. You, know, you can't really go face to face right now with every all the challenges that you face with COVID nineteen. So I was wondering, you talked about the platform that you guys use to give advice to small businesses virtually. Um, is there any way that you could give us like some sort of insight into how that works? Because I know for a lot of companies that's really been a struggling point and a, uh, something they've had to adapt to these last four months. So I was wondering if you could give us some insight in how you guys did it. Sure. You know, how the uh, how the platform works or how the platform came about? How the platform works and also how you get it out to your clients, how sure. they, they can use it with accessibility. Yeah. So the platform, the way the platform works is that it's pretty straightforward. So a business owner starts by filling out a basic profile and it's their, you know, it's their, their name, where the business is located, the type of industry they're in. And then we have a series of questions that understand the challenges and opportunities their business has, as well as like drilling down to make sure that the problems they, they think they have are really what they need help with. You know, a business, a business owner might say, or might think like, oh, if I, if I could just improve sales 10%, I'd be golden when maybe they really, you know, maybe they really have some issues with pricing 
with budget management. And so we ask a series of questions just to make sure that we have a full picture of the business. And then once they submit their profile, they have a quick call with our relationship managers who get to know not just the business, but how the business owner operates so that we can give them the best possible match. And we do the same thing with, with anyone who's volunteering as a business expert to really understand their, their skills. And then we have an algorithm that returns the best possible matches for each uh, business owner. So from there, we'll propose a match, the business owner will get matched and they'll work with their advisor for you know, five hours or more a month in whatever capacity they need. You know, they could talk on the phone, they could video chat, um, they could be back and forth on emails. I, I, I advise people on marketing through the platform and I mainly do it on Zoom once a month and email and text back and forth as needed. And we have people that get advice for two, three, four months on a project and then they, they move on to something else. We have other business owners who you know, might be working with an advisor for years because they're, they're getting so much out of it. And once someone feels like they've gotten what they need from their advising match, they can, they can come back for more. You know, we have business owners who've worked with us for years who've had six, seven, eight advisors in, in all different areas. You know, we've seen them grow from a small company with one employee to having, you know, 28 employees in three locations. Yeah. And of course, like within the operations that you were mentioning, it seems like there's a lot of tasks and steps involved. So what is something about the marketing field and industry that um, people generally tend to overlook? And at the same, at the same time, what do people generally tend to overemphasize? I think, that's a good question. You know, in, in marketing, I think people tend to sometimes with business owners, they can get bogged down in thinking through the tactical implementations of things without really thinking through the, the basics, the strategy, the audience, and the goals. So for a lot of business owners, if they're, if they're really, you know, they've, they've started their business because they're passionate about something, they're really good at something, um, they're baking, making up baking bread, um, selling something at a farmer's market or a craft market, you start a business, you're growing. When you realize you need to get people in the door, you don't always take the steps back to think, okay, who's my primary audience? Um, what are my goals? What do I need to, what's my cost of acquisition? Um, a lot of business owners jump right to the tactical stuff. Like, okay, how do I get some fancy ads on Facebook? How do I promote myself on Google? And then they end up, spending money to acquire customers that they might have been able to organically get if they'd done the basics first. Yeah. Um, you know, and so we, we see that a lot when we're, when we're coaching business owners. Um, and it makes sense, right? Like if you haven't, if you haven't been working in marketing for 20 years, like you don't know how to be a marketer from day one. Um, I think that's one of the things that people, people tend to overlook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you're mentioning, you know, a lot of people, when they first enter a marketing position, you know, it, it takes some time to actually get used to it. So, I mean, I know you're not, probably not directly involved in the hiring of a lot of um, people in your, in, under you, on your team, but, you know, for those looking to get into marketing departments or venture capitalists, how would you advise that they pitch themselves? And, like, what are you looking for specifically as an employee that you've enjoyed? You know, uh, what are some qualities? I think that, you know, I guess my biggest advice is to, you know, if there's a, a firm or a type of organization that you're really interested in working for, if there's, if there's someone there who has the job you want, like find them on, find them on LinkedIn and just see if you can, you know, meet for coffee or I guess now, you know, meet for coffee on Zoom. Like it, having an informational interview, and I didn't, you know, this isn't something I learned until I was like in my thirties, but having an informational interview is a great way to start getting introduced to the field, to have your name in front of people. And, you know, the, the, vast, the vast majority of jobs in this country, at least white collar jobs, then this is also a racial equity issue. So I'm 
to put it out there, but the vast majority of jobs never really get posted on places like, like LinkedIn, Indeed, Classdoor. A lot of jobs are filled by, by people in their internal networks. You know, like if you, if a company has a need, like if, if I have a need to hire a copywriter or a digital marketing manager or a social media manager, if I know of someone who'd be a good fit for that, that person, you know, maybe not for me personally, but I, a lot of folks will just think, oh, I know someone who's a good fit for that. Let me reach out to them and see if they're interested. That job might never appear online um, as an open position. And so, you know, having informational interviews and just like reaching out to the places you want to work to get to know people there is a great way to get in the door and you know, see if, uh, if you're coming out of school, see if they have an internship. Even if they don't post internships, see if they will take one on. You know, I've definitely had interns um, when we weren't planning to hire any interns. You know, so I've had a couple of MBA students who have reached out saying, you know, hey, I, I have four months this summer. I'm, look, I'm interested in learning more about your field. Is there anything that I could do with you? And we said, well, you know, we weren't planning on it, but yeah. You know, sure, like we can we can bring on an intern. Here's how we do it. Here's a project you can work on. Um, so you know, be be bold and, and and reach out. I think that's a great way to really get in the door um, and to get in front of people. And if nothing else, maybe you'll learn things about the industry or the business that you didn't know before. Yeah, and um, I think like being bold and also like showcasing who you are is generally very good quality for marketing because you kind of show your true audience. Um, specifically that you maximize your impact when even creating like an impact report. So for me personally, I'm working as an intern at the Community Reinvestment Fund, which is a debt-based CDFI. So what would be the biggest tip you would give um, for, for that organization to when, when creating um, an impact report? Like how, how would you go, how would you say they can maximize their impact when marketing it? When they're, when, you know, when you're creating an impact report, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. The first thing you really have to think about is who's the audience for your report. You know, most organizations, most when you're putting out, when you're a communications professional and you're putting out an impact report, you you would love to think that 65 million people are going to read your report. Uh, they're not. <laughs> um, you know, speaking from my own experience, we put out some. I, I think pretty good impact reports uh, we have over the years. And most of the people who read our impact reports are our current funders and investors and potential future funders and investors. And that can be, you know, that can be a pretty small or, you know, medium sized circle. So you should look at the reports, the other kinds of reports that the people you're writing for are also reading to see how you compare both uh, you know, with content and visually. And reports should really tell the story that you want to tell about your organization. You know, you have to be, you have to be completely transparent with things that haven't worked and your financials, but you need to tell the story about what makes you and your firm unique, especially in the eyes of investors or in the eyes of, of funders who are getting bombarded with requests for money. You know, what makes you different from other organizations that on paper might seem to be very similar to you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one, and, and, sorry, I was, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, so one, one quick comment that I actually had. So I, I, I was listening to like a presentation yesterday about kind of storytelling and making, making sure that you maximize your impact. And one thing that kind of resonated with me was um, kind of make your audience the hero and show that you really, that you really, that they made a difference and kind of um, they create, they, they were, they allowed for the change to be made rather than kind of betraying yourself as the hero. Cause sometimes people not, not, might not like that. And I think when making sure that your audience, is the hero that kind of makes more unique and potentially can create more marketing and people um, more, more interested. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, and something else you can something else you should be thinking about is how how to make your work resonate emotionally with your audiences. You know, we as an organization, we invest in, you know, close to a thousand businesses a year. And 
when we put out our reports, when, we, when we're marketing and we're talking about our work, we always lead with the businesses we're investing. In. You know, we we invest in small businesses in order to help those businesses create jobs. Mm. The end goal of our work as an investor is to create good paying jobs with benefits and flexible schedules for working people. But we, you know, but the, the heroes of our work are business owners. They're the business owners we invest in. You know, we, we, have, we have capital, we have networks, we have advice, but we're not the ones creating jobs. We're creating the conditions so that business owners who are running great companies can run them better and bigger and create good jobs. And they're, you know, they're the heroes of our work. And we try to, to put that forward in everything we do. Great. Yeah, and um, you were mentioning earlier the importance of transparency at your firm, and I think that's something that, you know, this world in general, not only companies, but this world in general is lacking, and, you know, by really showcasing where you've had failures and being honest about it, I think you know, that's really impactful work even beyond what you guys are doing for a lot of small businesses. Um, and so just to transition, this is the question we always end with our interviews with, is I know how you mentioned earlier about being bold, but is there any other advice you would give the high school students looking to start the process of making an impact in society? You know, don't think about what's, think about what's important to you. Think about the world that you want to live in in the future that you want to leave for your kids. Mm -hmm. And go out and start making change. You know, little, little things help. Organizations need volunteers. Bodies need to be in the streets protesting. Write, like, write to your Congress people and senators. Um, that is like a very small thing that not a lot of people do, and they do read that stuff. Like their offices get, their offices, um, get reports on how their constituents are reacting to legislation. Um, you know, Start if you have the means to start a social enterprise. That's what you want to do. Then you know, go go for it um, in as much as is possible. Don't you know? Don't feel hamstrung by by folks who are who are naysayers. You know, and have have hope. Um, you know, Ibram Max Kendi says that you can't you can't be a change maker and a pessimist at the same time. If you want to change the world, you have to have hope for a better world to do it. So do it, you know, go forward and should do it joyfully. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, it was, a, it was an honor and a privilege interviewing you and um, kind of hearing your story and looking to the advice you gave. So thank you. Thank you for talking with me today. Yeah.